to the next talk. And the, the speaker is David Serna and it's joint work with Temur Kutsia, unit anti-unification type and algorithms. And I'm going to switch okay. to David. Yes, so you have so the spotlight now. The screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Let me just make it full. Oh, no, presentation. Good. Okay, then I'll, I'll start then. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm presenting on unital anti unification. I'm going to give a uh, type, or at least for one of the theories, I'll give a type, and then we'll give some uh, algorithms to go with it. So as you can see, this. I'll work my way into the title of this section of FSCD, which is grammars, and essentially talking about what uh, grammars and anti-unification have had to do with each other over the years as I get to our results. So for those who don't know what anti-unification is, all right, I give the normal term construction here where you have an alphabet and you have a set of variables. Terms are inductively constructed over this. Substitutions map variables to terms of T sigma V. And what everybody here is probably familiar with, unification. Uh, you have two terms out of this, and you want to know if there exists the unifier, the sigma, such that the two terms are made equivalent over some, I didn't put anything on this equal sign, but over some equality. All right. Anti unification, what uh, you will be familiar with by the end of this talk, I'll say it many times. This is a, where you take some third term out of the language and you start with some two terms, T1 and T2. And you want to find some substitutions such that this third term T3 and the substitution one is equal to T1 and the same thing T3 with the substitution two is equal to T2. So you have these two matching problems that have to be solved by this term three. So we refer to this term three as a generalization. So I put it on the slide, I didn't hide it, but uh, it might be aware of, some people might be aware of this that this term three, if it's just a variable, it works and we have a generalization. So yeah, we solve the anti-unification problem in the most boring way possible. So what we're actually interested in is what we call the least general generalizations, All right? So what is the least general generalization? So similar to the most general unifier, we just turn everything around. What we're looking at is we're looking at the generalizations have this ordering, there's a pre-order on them with the G2 is less general than, uh, or is more general than G1. If there exists some substitution such that G2 and that, with that substitution applied will equal to G1. So uh, G1 is the least general if for every comparable term, we have this property here that the comparable term is less general than G1 or more general than G1. I should not confuse those. So more is more general than G1. So uh, such anti antinivires are called the least general generalizations. This was originally from Plotkin and Reynolds independently in 1970. They showed that the syntactic first order language has this unique LGGs. All right. Though, as you see in my talk is about unital theories, not uh, when it comes to equational theories, if you had a first order equational theory to anti unification, it's not necessarily the case that it has a unique least general generalizer anymore. So an E generalization considers anti-unification where some special set of symbols, sigma E, subset of the alphabet are interpreted with respect to equational theory. So I will represent this for the rest of the talk where this E is some equational theory and we say equals over that equational theory or less or this general, let's say generalization pre-order over that equational theory. So when I said there was more than one solution, all right, we have to define these extra things like what is a complete set of solutions and what is a minimal set? So the complete set is essentially you have this set of solutions so that any solution to this anti-unification problem T equals triangle S, all right? We have this property that there exists something in that complete set for any generalization of, these, of this problem such that that thing in the complete set is less general than of the other solution. So we always have this ordering relation there and that's the complete set, all right? We could look at the minimal complete set, which is the same thing as a complete set, except for every member in it is incomparable over this ordering with respect to the equational theory. So I give the four types of complete sets, which 
this comes from unification theory as well. All right, so unitary, this would be the syntactic first order. Anti-unification as mentioned before. Then we have the finitary case, which there's finitely many solutions in this uh, minimal complete set. So this was shown in um, Al Puente et al, 2014. You have this A uh, mo anti unification modulo A, C, and AC. All right. So quite recently, uh, me and uh, Tamor, we showed that, well, for anti unification over purely idempotent theories, this is including uh, theories with only one idempotent uh, function symbol, anti unification is infinitary. So that means that this minimal complete set will contain infinitely many incomparable solutions, all right? And the focus of this talk is when the minimal complete set does not even exist. So this was shown in earlier work with, uh, by uh, Tamer with respect to nominal anti-unification, but not over an equational theory like we have here where it's the equational theory when you have two or more unit uh, symbols, symbols that are interpreted uh, to have a unit element. Then you get a nolary, uh, then this complete set is nolary. It doesn't exist. So uh, more about this is that, so the unit element theories were studied also in this earlier work by El Puente, right? And it's, it's kind of known that this is, uh, it's infinite. Like it's, it's kind of, if you have enough unit elements, it's seen that it was in, at least infinite, all right? Similar with idempotent theories, right? That they're at least infinite. This was from a technical report from Potier in 1989, where a, an example was given with two idempotent function symbols that though it has infinitely many solutions, or at least the complete set is infinite. All right. So this is this is this kind of uh, equational theories lead into infinite sets of generalizations, kind of motivated. I, at least this is why I read read the literature that this work from 2005 where you could look at a grammar transformation so you're trying to do a transformation to a tree grammar and you could extract a complete set of generalizations for an anti-unification problem all right this is like an exhaustive construction of everything all right we um, looked at this as well with using grammar so not a grammar transformation but instead what we looked at is a grammar-based algorithm and that's how we got infinitary type for AU modulo anti-unification by creating a grammar-based anti-unification algorithm. All right. And if we look at this uh, <clears throat> classifications in Siegman uh, 1989, right, we see that both of these are collapsed theories. Not that this says much about them like, because both uh, unit element and idempotent are collapsed theories, but we thought, well, let's try a similar technique. Let's try to use grammar-based methods to make an algorithm. So let's look at this problem here. This is a, this problem will show up at least three more times in this talk. This is G of F of AC, A, and in, you want to find this uh, anti-unifier or a generalization for it with G of C, B. And we're gonna take this equational theory down here, EU, which is gonna have the unit element axioms. So I'm gonna use the rules from Alpente 2014, this expand rule, and let's get, uh, um, Let's get a generalizer using it. So you can see here, I marked in red where the expand rule is applied. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to put in this F symbol here so we could continuously decompose the terms. And eventually we get this generalizer on the bottom, G of F of X3, C, X2, all right? So expand allowed you to do further decomposition by introducing F, all right? It results in a finitary set of, um, least general generalizations is minimal complete for the linear variant. So specifically this linear variant minimal completeness we discussed in another paper that was published roughly at the same time as this, which is on uh, uh, mathematical structures and computer science. This was particularly over high order terms and not over first order terms. So uh, let's look at an unexpected LGG that comes when we break the expand rule. So this expand rule requires that F has to occur either on the left or right side as the head symbol of the anti-unification problem. And the reason for this is because of infinite cycles. If you think about it, we could, if we didn't have this requirement, you could continuously put in F symbols and continuously decompose and the algorithm would not necessarily terminate, all right? So when we, but when we drop this restriction, something weird happens because if we choose the right derivation path, all right, so you see, I have this rule here marked DHU, all right? This is the first blue uh, anti-unification problem in, the in this 
derivation, right? What we did is we just inserted a, a unit element, but in the right way, and it allows us to get a new generalization. So I, you see this generalization down here in bold, g of f of x3, c, f of x3, x6. All right, and surprisingly, it is less general than the one we got in the previous case. So doing this DHU rule allows us to get something less general, all right? But it also, without any controls, it gives you infinitely many derivations that are not this nice. They don't give you this nice property. So this shows us that we could get something less general if we uh, weaken this expand rule a bit. So here goes the DHU rule formally. All it's doing is it's just saying, well, you take the left and right hand side, you make two new anti-unification problems and you just put the uh, unit element in the middle. So the unit element of F. I already did the decompositions here, All right? This is not necessary for the linear variant. They won't do anything when you have a linear in the linear variant. All right, so the expand rule is enough there. But if you want to have nonlinear generalizations, this you need this rule. All right, so <clears throat> we thought, okay, this um, this infinitary behavior, this uh, cycling, all right, this is similar to what happened in the paper from 2019 with idempotent anti-unification. All right, so we think, okay, let's try tree grammar-based algorithms like we did there. So we have these remaining questions on the bottom here. One of them is, well, is this affinitary? If we look at anti-unification over here, of course, non-linear, the non-linear anti-unification is affinitary. Can we get a complete algorithm? And what happens when we have multiple uh, unit functions and unit symbols, all right? And does there exist an algorithm in this case when you have multiple? So these are the answers we're gonna give in this talk. Uh, I'm gonna start with three, the most, from me, this is one of the more interesting results here. All right, and the last one is a big open question because we haven't been able to prove completeness of this and I could go over some of the problems with this and most likely the answer is no. But let's start with uh, point three here. So we're looking at a purely multi-unital anti-unification. All right, so this is, we're not gonna look at any other part of any, adding any other equational theory like associativity, commutativity, nothing else this year. We just look at this theory here, which we call U2, all right? And we're gonna particularly call the anti-unification problem, or we're gonna look at this anti-unification problem here, epsilon f, epsilon g, where these are the unit elements of the two uh, unital functions, all right? And obviously the easiest solution is x, all right? So just like before the trivial anti-unification solution works here, all right? Now, important thing to notice, I did not use zero and one here because I don't want to, to put in this emphasis that this is like addition and multiplication because that adds a lot more complications. We're looking at something very simple here, just epsilon f, epsilon g. This is an elementary theory, nothing else other than the symbols of the, of the equational theory. So what are the other solutions here? All right, let's go back to DH rule, right? So DH rule works in the nonlinear case. It worked, we got a new generalization before, let's try it now. So we apply the DH rule, we do some solves, and what pops out is we get actually a new uh, generalizer. We don't get x, we get g of x1, f of x3, x1. This is one of many, actually. There's many other ones we could get just by how we apply the dh rule and how we do solve, all right? And if you notice, this generalization is over this equational theory, less general than x. Not only that, notice that we could actually repeat this process again on x1 and x3. So this is actually a repeatable process infinitely many times. Okay, so we mentioned it before. Everybody knows unitil theories are uh, infinite. So, okay, great. We got a repeatable process. We are still with the status quo in some sense. Okay, so we have this infinite sequence. Does not guarantee no, uh, nolarity. Let's get some more properties and see what happens. All right, so here go two theorems from the paper. The first one is a bit funny, right? We have either every generalization is either a variable or contains two distinct variables. Now, this could happen multiple occurrence of those distinct variables. And we could actually do this. We could do a transformation into this form using the substitution, all right? And I, I highlighted this word here in the last uh, theorem, which is reduced generalization. So what is a reduced generalization? So one thing we do here is we force some properties on the substitutions, all right? So we say that the substitution must 
uh, it can, if the two variables in the generalization, right, the variable cannot be matched like this. So two variables cannot be, or yeah, the variables cannot match to the same value. So sigma one cannot be applied to X cannot equal to sigma two applied to X. And the second point is, is that for each variable, each pair of variables, they're either the same variable, all right, or they differ on some sigma one or sigma two. Remember, we're on it. We're in an elementary language right now, so there's not much that could go into this substitution, all right. And that's part of the thing here is that we could only really substitute either epsilon f or epsilon g. Any other complex terms we go over this in the paper cannot be substituted, all right. So we could use this term we created before g of x f of y x to construct a less general generalization. So. Here we formalize this and uh, the question is, is that so when we have this uh, g of x, f of y, x, when we just have the term x, this is easy to see that it's less general. Here we're talking about an arbitrary generalization, which can, that arbitrary generalization could be put into reduced form as we discussed in this slide. And from that reduced form, right, we're saying that we could always construct a less general generalization. So what is it we have here? It, like I said, if g is x, it's trivial. Right. If it's not x, all right, based on this case distinction we made here, and the fact that g only has two variables, right, what we see is, is that the occurrences of x and g is n, and we could say the occurrences of y and g is m, and it must be the case that n and m are greater than zero, all right, by the properties we've said so far. And that implies that when we look at g prime and we substitute x with this term here, we have to have two n occurrences of x and n plus m occurrences of y. It turns out that if we ask the question of G prime is less is more general than G, this results in a contradiction because either N has to equal to zero or M has to equal to zero. Neither one of them could be the case. Therefore, we end up a contradiction and it shows that it must be the case that the other way holds. And we know they're not equivalent. So of course the equivalence has to be handled as well. I think I should have put it here, but yeah, just the typo there should have been less than or equivalent. Okay, so now we get to the final slide, which is about the complete set for of generalizations for epsilon f, epsilon g. All right, then every complete set must contain these terms that are ordered, and the theorem is right here, or the proof is actually quite simple. We just take something in g, we make that so we take some g and c, we make that g and c reduced. Then, by the previous theorem that I just showed, we could find something less general. And by completeness of C, that less general thing also has to be in C. And we get that G prime has to be this G ver theta phi mu. And we could do this over and over again, uh, resulting in the nullarity. All right. So beyond the purely unital theories, what can we say about it? Seems to hold for associative and commutative theories. If you notice this, um, this generalizer here, G X F Y X, it's something that shows up a lot in the associative commutative world. All right, this kind of generalization. We had it in our other papers. It breaks with idempotency if both symbols are idempotent, not so clear with one symbol, right? And maybe this is the wrong seed for idempotency. But this motivated looking into fragments. So now, this, let's see, I go through this a little bit faster because most of the slides that are left here are not really anything but the algorithms being described. So what we did is we went with a tree grammar based algorithm. And the only thing that differs from standard anti-unification algorithms, we have this set of AUTs, which we're trying to solve. We have the solve set, but we add this cycle set. And instead of having a, anti, a generalizer at the end as the last part of this uh, quadruple, we have a set of bindings, which is a variable mapped to a term. All right? And we collect these bindings to make the, uh, the tree grammar, which represents a set of all solutions. And rules are applied exhaustively in the neck. I'll show the rules soon. And then we have a strategy called step. So the rules look like this. So if you notice decomposition is like you just decompose a term if it has the same symbol into simpler anti-unification problems. But notice that for the binding set, we apply a binding to the set of bindings. This is essentially substituting all occurrences of X in the binding set on the right-hand occurrence of the binding by this term here, all right? In another case, you have expansion for a unit similar to the expand rule that I mentioned before. Instead of applying the bindings, what we do here is we add new bindings for each of the terms that we construct, so decompose to. So we add a binding for each one of those terms. 
If you notice, we have here x1 g of t uh, epsilon g. So we put in a binding for that, uh, a binding coming from x. All right, and the solve rule, it just adds the uh, a solved AUP to the solve set. So the strategy essentially is we select an AUT from the arbitra arbitrarily from the set A, we apply a rule applicable to A. There's usually only one, there's always actually one rule that's applicable. And then we, uh, we apply that rule. If it's expand U both, we immediately apply decomposed to the resulting, uh, to the resulting AUPs. And if it's also expand UL or expand UR, we also do this immediate decomposition application. This is what it looks like here, the algorithm. And all of these red parts are the conditions that have to hold, which are just taking the rules I mentioned before and turning them into conditions in the algorithm. All right, and the algorithm is quite simple. It's right here, you see step, that's the procedure I mentioned before. And we just keep doing this until the A, set A is empty. All right. So we show that this is sound. That means that the language here that we get, the language of the grammar that's constructed from the binding set, all right, it is. It always creates a generalizer, all right? And then we also have the completeness of this uh, algorithm. I say that we every single time we get a generalizer, we, <clears throat> or every generalizer that occurs in this set here is, uh, <clears throat> we could get a least general generalizer out of it. Ah trying to catch up with time. <laughs> so yeah, okay, I just go to the example here. This is the example run on the previous um, one I mentioned earlier. We have the rules applying on the side here in the order that they would be in the strategy. And we get this uh, language of the grammar right here where we get the two separate parts, these two solutions to it. And we notice that one of them is the less, least general generalizer and is less general than the other. So now I get to the more complicated rules, which is the ones for um, the one unital fragment. This is when we only have one unit uh, function. So this is the one I mentioned earlier, one of the cases we wanted to handle. And here we actually use this start cycle and saturate cycle, which are a bit complicated rules. So the start cycle is essentially implementing the DHU rule that I mentioned earlier and keeps track of the cycling in this set L. This is this red part in the middle here. It's keeping track of the cycling. And we add bindings to the binding sets for each one of the AUPs that comes out of the application. And the saturate rule just says that, because there's something you notice here that if you look at the start cycle, the original AUP is, is still there, but with a new variable. So we add a fresh variable there. The star saturate cycle allows us to saturate that case and also allows us to saturate whenever that term shows up at another point in uh, the AUP. It allows us to also saturate in that case so that we don't, oh, we consolidate all of the cycles together. This adds just one extra step to the algorithm, this merge, uh, this here, we add this extra step where we do the cycling. After we do the cycling, we decompose. And after we decompose, we exhaustively do sat cycle until we cannot apply it anymore. And we do this uh, continuously. This is called the cycling procedure. So we see here, the. The new algorithm for the one unital fragment is when you have the cycling procedure followed by step, and then we exhaustively apply the SAT cycle. And in the end, we also merge uh, inside the solution set uh, AUPs that are the same until we cannot merge anymore. All right. Surprisingly, even though this grammar can have infinitely many terms in it, the language of this grammar, only a finite set of them are actually incomparable. And therefore, the one unital fragment turns out to be finitary. So here goes the example from before, where I, the same one that I did in all the other examples. This is the grammar that would come out after a bit of cleaning. So after cleaning redundant things. And we would get this on the bottom. We see the solution from the linear case is more general than the solution that we get here, or the two solutions we get here, modulo commutativity. And finally, for the purely multi-unital theories, we have the branching cycle rule, which is the same as the start cycle rule, except now is that we have more than one unit element. And if you notice in this collection L now, we're adding the unit element to there until we've done the cycling rule for each unit element in every case. So as you see, this gets to be quite complex how much we're actually doing in here, all right? And in general, all the other rules are still here, including the, the start cycle and the saturate. So all we're doing here is that 
we for this strategy is we do the cycling strategy, all right, followed by branch cycle, and we do branch cycle until we cannot do it anymore, until we run out of um, units, unit elements. And then we do step, and we exhaustively do sat cycle. And then finally, in the end, we do all of the merging. So we always leave the merging for last. This is the grammar that would come out if we apply the algorithm to epsilon f, epsilon g. All right. And here go some examples of what would come out of this grammar. Like these, these are some of the terms that will come out. Of course, there's infinitely many of them that are incomparable because it's a nullary theory. All right. And infinitely many that are comparable. All right. And we just give one comparison here on the bottom. So I end with a conclusion we had in the paper about future work. And these are just some problems. I can leave this slide up for the questions and answer sessions. These are the things that we would be interested in continuing to research in the future. Some of them here, for example, considering some of the combined theories like ACUI and UI, so as associative community of unit item potency, all right, finding a complete procedure. And also, I, this has been um, extended to semi rings. And this is like no Larry in most cases, essentially, of semi rings, except for one of the cases which has two item potent elements. So that's the end of the talk and yeah, I'll leave it here. Okay, many thanks for the talk. And yeah, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, you've got lots of questions already oh. there. Okay. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, let's see if anybody wants to ask any question. Are there any questions uh, from the attendees? I don't see anything in the Q&A or raised hands. So it seems that there are, okay. If, if anybody has a question, please use the Q&A or raise your hand. Um, and in the meantime, we have all these lists that you have given us mm -hmm. in this slide. Actually, the, the thing I was thinking about was, uh, you put it there, I think it's the third one, because I was wondering what happens, what, what do we know or what can we do? If we know that in addition to maybe these two units, mm -hmm. you do have uh, A and C. I was thinking of uh, plus and multiplication, even though you yeah. said we shouldn't. <laughs> so yeah, the, I, I, I looked into this. I mentioned this technical report on the bottom here. And so it doesn't really change much when you add A and C to the two unit case. But in the one unit case, all right, this is something we haven't done, we haven't fully explored. All right, this would be similar to what was explored in earlier work, but now with this additional fragment, this one unit fragment. And there, it seems um, that this would be an interesting direction to go. I've only looked at it a little bit, but this would be probably the same types would hold as it held before, which is infinitary, mm -hmm. but with lots of generalizations. Okay. Okay, so... Okay, if there are no other questions, then we can thank you again.